How is you? It's good. One of the prophetic words that we got last week from um, somebody, one of the Bethel team members, who did they tell us to? I know it was me, somebody else too. Um, I may, I, I won't use the exact words because there are children in the room. But they said, you know, our congregation is full of people who are used to going all out. Right? Anybody in the room like have ever been told like it's all or nothing with you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, fast. Like, okay, yeah, I get it. We go all out, right? And now we found the love of Jesus, and we're all in. Yeah. Like all the other stuff, it's all or nothing, and so we're going all the way. If God said it, I believe it. I'm going all in, right? Amen. We're all in. So why don't we stand up? We're going to go all in and worship this morning. The Bible tells us to bring a sacrifice of praise. How many of you know you can't have a sacrifice unless it costs you something? A sacrifice means it costs you something. Maybe it's going to cost you this morning your logical mind. Maybe it's going to cost you moving your body or making a sound that you've never made before. <laughs> Maybe it's going to cost you like not caring who's sitting next to you. Maybe it's going to cost you a little bit of time. You showed up. You're here. But we don't bring a sacrifice unless it costs us something. So God, this morning, we just bring you our sacrifice of praise. We bring you an offering this morning of thanksgiving and of, of worship, our adoration. Because we know that whatever we worship, we become like. And we just want to look more and more like you. Yes. So this morning, Jesus, we bring our sacrifice. We bring our worship. We bring our praise. We bring our adoration. Because you and you alone are worthy. Because you and you alone are worthy. You've been so good. And we take this moment to just give it back. To just pour it out. To just pour out the sacrifice.
truth. Grab onto that truth that promises never fail. His promises never fail.
what is going on. But the truth is, we were dead. Now we're not. Yeah. And a couple of us are happy about it. Yeah. We were dead, and now we're not. So we sing, your promises never fail, or you are worthy of it all, or hear the sound of dry bones rattling. That's what's happening in this building. Yes. Right. Dry bones rattling. You're still holding on to some promises. You still feel like, I don't know, I'm just... I'm just getting my toes wet. That's all right. Come on. That's all right. Come on in. The water's fine. The water's fine. Come on in. The water's fine. Amen. Amen. I think you guys mean it today. Turn to the person next to you. Give them some love in, and uh, we will be right back with you. So I'm doing announcements. I've got an announcement for you. I heard on the way in someone said, I hope this time is the time. And I'm here to announce to you, if that was you, I know who you, but I know there's more than just that one person that feel like that about this season of their life. That this time isn't the time. Is You know, I've been through this before. I've screwed up so many times. I've let so many people down. But God says the stone has been rolled this entire time to step out of the grave. To step out of the grave with me today, I'll take your guys' hands. Just look in your imagination as I just I just walk with you and pull you out of that, guys, because it's just in your head. Right. Today's the day. Today's the day you get to lock that freedom. So can you guys do that with me? Yes. yes. <laughs> I am free. I just saw like just a change. Just, you know, Jesus likes to karate chop those bad boys. All you got to do is hold them out, stretch them wide. All right, so we did worship night on Friday at the meeting place. Who was there? Yeah. Oh, man. It got so crazy that at one time a dog was in there. It came out of nowhere. It came off the street. It was up on stage. It scared the living daylights out of time. I thought it was awesome. Yeah, so we're going to be doing that every, last Friday of every month. 
at the meeting place in Dresser. Yeah. Uh, we also have a Wednesday night. I should. Say, I, I'm a part of the group now. I got the official Jay's carpeting sweatshirt. So, which is the highest crown of glory you can that can be bestowed upon you at the meeting place. So. I can officially say we are hosting a Bible study there on Wednesday nights at 6.30 now, right, or 7? 7 o'clock. So, um, at last Friday of the month, we're going to be doing the worship nights every Wednesday Bible study. And it's not your, like, typical Bible study. It's more of, like, an open conversation back and forth. And sometimes we might only read one verse, and it just sparks this entire um, dialogue for, I've been there for the three hours sometimes, so it's pretty fun. Transformed Women in the Bible, Bible Study, Monday, April 26th via Zoom. So, Transformed Women in the Bible, Bible Study, Monday, April 26th via Zoom. Who's putting that on? Pam. Pam. So, see Jenny to get information about how to... Jenny, can you raise your hand? Yeah, see her if you want to be involved in that. Transformation class, Tuesday, April 27th, 6 to 7 p.m. via Zoom. That is with Stephen Ronda, Correct. Pastor Stephen Ronda, yes, Ronda's back there. If you've seen that lovely gentleman with her, her husband, that's who you go see. Salty Lemonade Chat with Rhonda. We just we just officially met Rhonda. So Saturday, May 1st, 10 to noon. I heard there was some pretty transformative stuff that happened at the last one. Did anyone be able to verify that for me? Tyler. <laughs> it doesn't say women only, it just says salty lemonade. It's exclusive about it. I think Chris showed up too on accident to one of them. Um, pancake breakfast, Sunday, May 2nd, 9.30 a.m. Everybody loves pancakes. Worship nights here, Saturday, May 8th, 6 to 8. Um, you guys are obviously going to have to grab a bulletin. I can barely keep up and I got it right in front of me. So, a lot going on. This is really important. If you or someone you know either struggles with some sort of addiction, affliction, ailment, um, and wants freedom. And maybe you've experienced freedom, maybe that addiction or that affliction isn't holding you captive anymore, but you just haven't got that fourth dimension of existence that you see everybody else living in, that's also for you. That's or right. For someone you know. Oh. Um, that is called the Cave and Believe Retreat. We just officially opened registration yesterday or yeah. two days ago, and it's came to believe recovery.org. You can find out all the retreats worldwide, but the local one will be on there, and that's in Amory, Wisconsin, at Camp Waco, May 14th through the 16th. Who's been to a Camp to Believe retreat and it changed their life? Yeah! Yeah, so if you're looking for a life-changing experience, that's the place to be. Worship at the meeting place, I already nailed that. Awesome, so I saw you in the drum cage, and can you stand up, please, everybody say hi to Tyler, Pastor Tyler. <laughs> Yeah, pretty cool vision of you when I was in the drum cage and you were Jesus was carrying you as the lost, you know, the one the one that got away, the one sheep that he went out and he dug. Uh, he left the 99 back and he was carrying you on his back, but on your back was just like this infinite pile of other lost sheep. Oh, yeah. You're like the, the head of the lost sheep, like whatever your group is, man, you carried a lot of people in with you at that very yeah. moment. So yeah. Yeah. I'm really excited to hear this guy talk today. Give up to Pastor Tyler Melina. at all. I forgot offering, but I did have something prepared for you guys today. I was just so excited to give you that word. Right? Right? <laughs> all right, so I don't want to take up a ton of your time, but um, when Jesus was hanging out with the Pharisees, they were always trying to trap him. So they said, uh, they asked him this question. So tell us then, what do you think? Is it proper for us Jews to pay taxes to Caesar? Jesus knew the malice that was hidden behind their cunning ploy and said, why are you testing me? You imposters. I wouldn't want to be called that by Jesus. Who thinks you have all the, who think you have all the answers? Show me one of the Roman coins. Show me a quarter. Show me a dollar bill. So they brought him a silver coin used to pay the tax. Now tell me, whose head is on the coin and whose inscription is stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. George Washington's, they replied. Uncle Sam, they replied. Precisely, for the coin, coin bears the image of the Emperor Caesar. Well, then you should pay the emperor 
what is due to the emperor. Because you bear the image of God, give back to God all that belongs to God. Amen. Amen. So who knows that that's more than just money when they're talking about that, correct? That's right. Well, Jesus then comes back in John 3, 3, and he says to him, uh, he says to Nicodemus, I speak eternal truths about things I know, these things I've seen and experienced, and still you don't accept what I reveal. If you are unable to understand and believe what I've told you about the natural realm, what will you do when I begin to unveil the heavenly realm? Now trust me, the heavenly realm in the St. Croix Valley region is being unveiled every second, every minute, every hour. And if we're not capable of understanding the things he told us about just the natural realm, how are we going to accept and experience what's coming full force from the clouds in this very moment? Right. The reason I bring this up today is God specifically put this on my heart to say, get your money right. Get the way you think about your money right. I ain't talking about filling up the basket. I'm talking about a heavenly perspective on your finances. And I know if that's the case with everyone here, the baskets are going to be full to the brim. Give to, give to God what is God's because you bear his image. So something to think about as you're paying the counter or paying the person at the counter, wiping your debit card, sending a Venmo. Get your money right. Get your mind right. That's good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want your phone or am I keeping this? <laughs> you're a mess. <laughs> I'm going home. <laughs> Wait, I'm about to put some truth on it. Yeah. 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 Good morning. Good morning. How are you guys today? Good. Great. Oh, I heard of paradise, but everything else is kind of lackluster. Come on, guys. How are we today? Yeah. All right, there we go. All right. So we are going to talk today about perspective. Perspective and identity. Nice. So, what? Uh, oh, so we're going to talk about what in most Bibles is titled the Prodigal Son. The Passion Translation is the Loving Father. Right. Yeah. Ooh, it's a little, a little different. So we're going to read through it, and then we're going to break it down. All right, it's uh, Luke fifteen. It's awesome. Luke 15, uh, 11 through the end. <laughs> <laughs> then Jesus said, Once there was a father with two sons. The younger son came to his father and said, Father, don't you think it's time to give me my share of your estate that belongs to me? The father went ahead and distributed among the two sons their inheritance. Shortly afterward, the younger son had packed up his belongings and traveled off to see the world. He journeyed to a far-off land where he soon wasted all he was given in a binge of extravagant, reckless living. Been there. <laughs> With everything spent and nothing left, he grew hungry. There was a severe famine in the land, so he begged the farmer in that country to hire him. The farmer hired him and sent him out to feed the pigs. You guys know that that's like the lowest thing in like the Jewish. Uh, yeah. like the pigs are just the filth. You're now unclean. Right. And we'll get back to that. I remember that part. <laughs> uh, to feed the pigs. The son was so famished he was willing to even eat the slop given to the pigs because no one would feed him a thing. Humiliated. The son finally realized that he was do what he was doing and thought, there are many workers at my father's house who have all the food they want with plenty to spare. They lack nothing. Why am I here dying of hunger, feeding these pigs and eating their slop? Ew. Uh -uh. Where's 18? <laughs> All right. I want to go back home to my father's house. And I'll say to him, Father, I was wrong and I have sinned against you. I'll never be worthy, be worthy to be called your son. Please, Father, just treat me like one of your employees. So the young son set off for home. From a long distance away, the father saw him coming 
dressed as a beggar, and great compassion swelled up in his heart for his son who was returning home. So the father raced out to meet him. He swept him up in his arms, hugged him dearly, and kissed him over and over with tender love. Then the, father, or then the son said, Father, I was wrong to sit against you, and I could never deserve to be called your son. Just let me be. The father interrupted and said, Son, you are home now. Ooh. Turning to his servants, the father said, Quick, bring me the best robe, my very own robe, and I will place it on his shoulders. Bring the ring, the seal of sonship, and I will put it on his finger. And bring out the best shoes you can find for my son. Let's prepare a great feast and celebrate. For his beloved son, well, this beloved son of mine was once dead, but now he is alive again. Once he was lost, but now he is found. And everyone celebrated with overflowing joy. Now, the older son was out working in the field when his brother came. And as he approached the house, he heard the music of celebration and dancing. So he called over one of his servants and asked, What's going on? The servant replied, It's your younger brother. He's returned home. And your father is throwing a party to celebrate his homecoming. The older son became angry and refused to go in and celebrate. So his father came out and pleaded with him, Come and enjoy the feast with us. The son said, Father, listen. How many years have I been working like a slave for you? Performing every duty that you ask as a faithful son. And I've never once disobeyed you. But you've never thrown a party for me because of my faithfulness. Never once have you even given me a goat that I could feast on and celebrate with my friends like he's doing now. But look at this son of yours. He comes back after wasting your wealth on prostitutes and reckless living. And here you are throwing him a great feast to celebrate for him. The father said, my son, you've always been with me and by my side. Everything I have is yours to enjoy. It's only right to celebrate this overjoy and be overjoyed because this brother of yours was once dead and gone, but now he is alive and back with his son. He was lost, but now he is found. Amen. So, there's two perspectives, two views of the father here. I would contend that the first son knew what it meant to be a son, knew what came with that, and lost sight of it because of shame and guilt in the decisions he had made. The second son, the, the obedient second son, didn't know what the love of the father was. He thought it was performance-based. That's he thought that he, he viewed himself as a slave to the father performing to get the love that clearly from the text was unconditional love yeah. if you look even when the first son is out he says the workers of my father want for nothing I mean how good of, obviously this is a representation of the character of Christ <laughs> So how good is the father that even the workers who aren't his sons, the rest of the people in the world, the people we encounter, lack for nothing because of their relation to us? So the first son, we'll put it into context, when he came home, when the father saw him, he came as a beggar covered in the filth from the swine, come from eating the slop, unclean, unworthy, in the eyes of the law. Yeah. The father runs up, gives him a big old wet, sloppy kiss, <laughs> because it doesn't matter. Right. When you come home, you're home. Right. It's like the 99 to find the one, yeah. rejoicing because my son has come home. And I would also contend that once the father told the second son that everything I've had has always been yours, there was a revelation to him that brought healing. 
I mean, obviously the story stops there, but I would contend that once you come to character of Christ, it changes you. Wow. Yeah. So. No. Okay. Now, uh, so, I contend that both sons were carrying shame. Yeah. One, one came back with guilt and shame, you know, and Brene Brown says that guilt says I've done something wrong, and shame says I am something wrong. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There is a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So when we go out in the world and we do things that aren't what we think we should be doing as sons and daughters of God, we think that we're cut up. Yeah. We think that now, a lot of times, we skip right over guilt and we jump to shame. So when, when the Bethel team was here and we were met at the Pastor Higgins house, they asked us, you know, open your mind and see what lies does the devil throw at you with those fiery darts that come knocking off your square. And mine was your past. It's a shame. Like, you shouldn't be allowed to do what you do. I shouldn't be allowed to stand here. Which in the world is true. But in the kingdom, yeah. I'm wearing the ring yeah. of sonship. Yeah. 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 I have the ring of sonship. This is my rightful place because I am the son of God. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is my rightful place because Christ in me. Yeah. Yes, I shouldn't be allowed to stand up here, but Christ in me can stand right here and speak Ooh. his word. Yeah. So, Hebrews... 13.8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So that Father, no matter what our perspective is, as sons, whatever distorted, Jesus Christ is always the same. He doesn't change. So it's our, our view of the Father that has to change. Because his character never changes. So if we view his character as cutting us off because of a behavior thing, well, that's just not true. That's just not true. And, and like, we work with people in addiction. When they have a failure or they, you know, relapse or whatever, they go back out. We don't shut the door. Right. We don't just say, you messed up. Right. Right. You fix yourself and then come back and we'll talk. We love them through the process. Sometimes they come back, sometimes they don't. But all we can do is love them. Yeah. And I think the church for a long time has failed in that area. Yeah. Not, not this church. This church, I will tell you, this part of this is mad. <laughs> but the church universal is when there's been a failure, a moral failing, any kind of sin comes to light, you, you, can, you can come back, maybe, but if you do, you got to sit in the back. <laughs> you got to put in your time, you got to prove that we can trust you again. Come on. <laughs> we, we welcome you back but please don't make a scene and don't say anything we'll let you know when it's your time so let me tell you a story about I was on the deacon board here some of you probably heard this and I had a relapse and I ended up in jail what? I <laughs> was in jail? prison <laughs> no no. <laughs> no we're, we're. But, so I was in jail. There was a transition of leadership here. And so there, there's two significant things that stuck with me. One, when I was getting out, Steve said, and Steve is my spiritual father. So this is very significant to the character of Christ in my understanding. Getting out of jail, the terrible, you know, like, it was ugly. Anyways, he says, yes, it's time to kill the fatted calf. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. was figured that we had sick, but <laughs> yeah, so, symbolically, it was, it was a big deal. Right. When you say, let's kill the fatted calf, that is, my son has returned home. Come on. And there was no, all right, you get to sit in the back. We'll let you know when it's your time. Behave. If you can string together three, four, or six good months, we might like, let you come up to the third row from the back. 
<laughs> and then Pastor Sean, when I came up, he said, welcome home. Take your place. So after a failure like that, and you walk back in and you're empowered, and they say, dust your shoes off and keep moving, Come on. that's huge. When people believe in you before you believe in yourself. That's it right there. Where it's at. It's yeah. so like all my guys out here, yeah. second you walk through the door, we believe in you. Yeah. 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 So like, it is the goodness of God that leads to repentance. It is that encounter with the real character of Christ that says, oh, in the words of Steve, crap, you got me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can follow that. I can, that, that is something I understand, but you can't understand it until you've experienced it. It just, it just didn't work for me. I heard it. I heard it. I heard it, but then it was on display. It was on display. On display, and I, I learned it, I received it. Now it's a part of me, and that's what I do for you, all of you guys. And it is just a pleasure, pleasure, to work with all of you. And make no mistake, even when you mess up, even when you fall, Jesus is like, "Come on, get up, get up, let's go, let's go." And we, like we talk about, you know. Addiction is a progressive illness. But so is your calling. Not, not illness. Your calling is progressive. <laughs> it's not a progressive illness. It's like when, after you fall, you, just, you, know, you get up and you say, yes, God, let's go. He doesn't start you back at the beginning. It's not like, well, go back and you have to retrain and do all this. He's like, all right, let's go. You ready? Let's go. Yeah. Where you were supposed to be, then let's go. Yeah. Yeah. And it's exciting. Yes. I love it. So what I'm really want to go after today is those distorted views of the Father. The ones that still think that every time we mess up, every time we cuss or we watch a naughty movie that we're cut out from the Father, that His love somehow is withdrawn from us. And that is the exact opposite of how it works. Like, in His weakness, in your weakness, he is strong. Like he builds you up in those areas. So every time you get that by a place where you fail or where you're failing, move towards that because he's still there. Right. He fills in those lacking areas. But he's a good, good father. He's a good, good father, and his character doesn't change. So it's important that we don't put the shame on ourselves. And disqualify ourselves from the love of God because He never will. Good work. Yeah. Thank you. Amen. You know, I, it's funny because I was studying this this week and I, I was going to turn it into my message for the next time I talk, but I think it really ties right into what He's saying. He talks about the Father being the same now and forever, right? Now and forever, he's always been the same since the past, present, and future. He's never going to change. And who's Jesus? He's the perfect representation of the Father. Correct? So remember when Peter's going to deny Jesus three times? Jesus is pretty kind to tell him this is going to happen. Peter says, no, I'm not going to do it. Really knocks Peter off track, right? I mean, it says in the Bible that Jesus looked back and saw right into Peter's eyes when he stumbled and made that mistake. And the Passion Translation does such a, or the, the movie The Passion, Mel Gibson's Passion Translation, <laughs> does such a good job of capturing Peter's face when Jesus looks at him after he makes this huge mistake, and he's just devastated. And we've all been there. We've done these big things and maybe it was a short period of time, or maybe it was a long period of time. Maybe we went back for five, ten years, and we feel like there's no way possible that I can ever be the person I was supposed to be. I'll be lucky if I can just be God's slave. 
I'll be lucky if I can even just go hang out with the people that are at Living Word or Faith Community or OCC or wherever you go to hang out with believers. I'll just be lucky to get around them. But see, later on in the story, Jesus ends up at, uh, or Peter cuts himself off. He decides, you know, I think when Jesus looks at Peter, he's looking at him with a broken heart, so much compassion. Like, no, 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 don't, don't go anywhere. Stay with me. I know you're going to make these mistakes. Stay with me. And Peter decides, I'm not going to stay with him. I'm going to go back fishing. Goes back to his old life. He goes back to his old deal. And eventually, when he finally meets up with um, Jesus again, Jesus appears on the shore after he raises from the dead. Peter's so jacked up, he jumps into the water with his clothes on. I think it says he puts his clothes on and then jumps in the water. I mean, that's how excited he is. And you guys have heard me say this before. Peter says, Jesus says to Peter, um, do you love me? He never once says, Peter, what were you thinking? You spent three years with me. Why would you deny me? You're supposed to carry your cross and walk with me. What the heck were you doing? No, he says, do you love me? Peter says, of course I love you. Jesus says, feed my sheep. Get into your destiny. You've been called to be a shepherd. Feed my sheep. Third time, or second time. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Not anything about the mistakes he made. Not anything about screwing up. Just do you love me? Yes, I love you. Then feed my sheep. Let's do what we were called to do. Third time, Jesus, P Peter, do you love me? Yes, I do. He's starting to get frustrated. Like, why do you keep asking me this? Three times he restores for the three mistakes he made. Yeah. 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 See all that's going on there? And then they go on to talk about what he's going to do. But the thing, I, the thing I found this week was awesome. Um, Jesus says this to Peter before he tells him that he's going to deny him. This is literally in the same breath Jesus is talking to him. He says, Peter, my dear friend, listen to what I'm about to tell you. Satan has obtained permission to come and shift you all like wheat and test you and test your faith. But I have prayed for you, Peter, that you would, stay, you would stay faithful to me no matter what comes. Now remember, remember this. After you have turned back to me and I have restored you, make it your life mission to strengthen the faith of your brothers. Then he tells him about the mistake he's going to make, and then later on restores, Jesus, restores Peter. He says, P Peter, you're going to screw up. But when you've been restored back to me, when I've restored you, strengthen the faith of your brothers. That's what he's saying to all of us. If God is, was, and is to come the same person, he already knows that you're going to make mistakes. He already knows that you're going to screw up. He already knows that you're going to fall short. And all he wants to know at the end of the day is, do you love me? Can you give me that? If you can give me that, you can go anywhere with me. Feed my sheep. Tyler, do you love me? Chris, do you love me? Libby, do you love me? I don't care about how you screwed up and yelled at your kids the night before. I don't want you to do that. But if you love me and give your life to me, less and less of that will happen. And you will intuitively see God doing things for you that you could not do for yourself. Can I get an amen? Amen. Let me give allegiance to closing ministry, and then we'll get out of here. <laughs> Bill Johnson says he doesn't take away our ability to sin. He just makes it not fun anymore. <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit. This isn't about this like thing that's trying to like control you. It's about this light that just wants to shine on you. And so, Father God, right now, we just receive your love. Let's just start with that. We see you, Papa. Our Papa, our Abba, that's the word Abba is like literally translated daddy. Yes. Dad, my dad, my Papa, we see you. We turn our eyes to you. And in every way that there's been a distorted view of your love, just start to strip that away. Just tenderly and sweetly just start to take that away so we can see your love accurately. That all shame would be uprooted. I just, right now, I just stand in the gap to uproot every lie of shame in this room. Yeah. All across the room, every lie of shame, we just uproot that in Jesus' name. We uproot that in Jesus' name. What I just like symbolically, if you want to, just like reach down into your soul and pull it out. Just pull it out. Just pull it out. We uproot those lies of shame. And instead, we turn our eyes to see you, Papa. To see you, Abba. Our sweet and loving Father that's always just been wooing us home. And when you run out to meet us, you actually get dirty. You actually get dirty. You hug us in our filth, and you actually get that filth on you by accepting us into your love. 
So we just lean in. We're so grateful, and we're, we just know that you're so good. So in all the ways that we aren't able to see that, help us to see more clearly today. In all the ways that we've distorted that view or that, that life has distorted that view, we just want clear view again. Take us right back to the beginning. We just thank you for restoring. We thank you for restoring today all across this place. Every life, every marriage, every child, every home, even the ones that aren't yet back. Yeah, I just, I feel like we should lean into that too. You know, part of what we do is we stand in the gap for those who aren't here yet. Yeah. Right? Anybody have somebody in mind? We just stand in the gap for that prodigal. We just say, prodigal, come home. Prodigal, come home. <laughs> Jesus just interrupts that train of thought and said, nope, 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 you're home. You're back. And so we just call to that prodigal. We speak, we speak hope to the hopeless. We speak life to dry bones. And we just thank you in advance, God. We just know that you're already working. We know that you're already doing the work. Your promises never fail. So we thank you so much for already completing the promises that you've given us. Yeah. So the ministry team is going to be up here. If you have not yet received Jesus, actually, I just want to do something here really quick. We don't often do this, but the greatest miracle any one of us could ever experience in our life is to ask Jesus to be our Lord and Savior, right? Anybody in the room have already accepted Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? Amen. Yeah. Woo! If that's not you yet, and you want to receive Jesus today, would you be brave enough to just put your hand in the air? If you have not yet received Jesus, but today is your day, put your hand in the air. Anybody? Facebook Live, we're with you. We're with you, Facebook Live. If you have not yet received Jesus, but you would like to receive Jesus, our ministry team would love to, to pray with you about that. Or if you need health in your body, if you need health in your finances, you need health in your relationships, we'd love to stand with you for that. If you're good, go enjoy the sunshine. Love the people around you. Thanks for being here.